In this video, we are going to talk about coroutines. Coroutines are functions that you can stop right in the middle. So a normal function, you're going to call it and it runs one time until it returns some value or it returns nothing. But with a coroutine, you can stop it in the middle and give control back to the function or the GDScript class, if you want, that called it. And so you can communicate between two functions back and forth, you can send values, and you can do things like what we have here in OpenRPG. When you have a menu that's opening, you might have an animation that has to play and you want it to play until the end before something else happens. So you can use signals for that, or you can use coroutines. You can have a function that will block the interactions from the player until the animation is finished. Now with the input in, you can see that as the characters are moving around the screen, if I try to do things and I press lots of keys, it's not going to interrupt the interface, the animation will play until the end and the character can't mess with the game during that time. If you look at the Wikipedia page, it's not that accessible on coroutines, but I think the common uses is quite interesting to see when you can use that tool because coroutines are a flexible tool. They are especially nice when you are working with an application that has a client side and a server side and you need to wait for some values to arrive before you process them. So that's what communicating between the two functions does. If you ever use Python's generators or the concept of generators in programming languages where you can pull values from an iterator or some kind of container one after the other, these are a specific type of coroutine. Let's move on to some concrete examples. We're going to have some object that generates item, like a factory line. Every second, it's going to generate an item that we're going to add to our inventory. Here is the code. You can ignore the parts with the play button at the bottom. The coroutine is right here. It's that coroutine example function. So we have an item that has an inventory if you want. I call it items, but it's a dictionary that contains items and their amount. Now our coroutine example is a loop and that loop is going to add potions to the inventory and say the items that I own have been updated. So something else is going to receive the info. And we have that statement, the yield keyword, that's going to delegate control to a timer object. So here, we are calling create timer on the tree, which will create a timer node and start it, a timer that is going to run for one second. When you use the yield keyword, you want to yield until you receive some signal from the object. So coroutines also work with signals. We can use any signal here, but on the timer, we can use timeout to know when the timer finished running. So the function works this way. If the active variable is set to true, it's going to start the loop and it's going to wait for one second. So the function stops here until the timer runs out. When the timer runs out, we add one potion to the items, we emit the signal, and if the object is still active, we keep going down that loop. Now I'm going to launch the game to show you how things are going. So you have the code on the right. If I press play, I start the function every second the potion count will go up. One thing that's very interesting is when I press stop, it's going to set the object to be inactive. And when I press stop, after I pressed, the loop still finishes, like the function continues to execute and finishes the, the current loop. So I press play, and right when I create a potion, I press stop, and I still got one extra potion here. So the one thing to keep in mind with coroutine is that once you get the process started, you can't stop it that easily. The only way to stop it is here. You need to add an extra check to return from the function if the active condition is not fulfilled anymore. So after the yield, after you regain control in that function, you want to check if not active, you want to break from the loop. And you have to do that in your code. Another thing is if you change the state of the object in that function, 
you will want to clean everything up to undo all the changes that you had. So that's one limitation or rather the difficult part of using coroutines because they are asynchronous functions. So you have to make sure that when you stop them right in the middle of a given process, you have to resynchronize the state of the object or to reset it manually. The next example involves a character here. Let's look at the code because that's where everything is happening. So this character can move to a given position. We want to wait for the character to arrive to the position to allow it to move somewhere else. In this example, we are going to use the tween node and we are going to yield until the tween has been completed. The code works that way. When you click somewhere, if the tween is not running, we ask the character to move to the place where you clicked. And then the move to function takes over. So it starts the tween. It's going to make the character move to the position, to the target at a certain speed. And then we use the yield keyword to wait for the tween node to emit the tween completed signal. And until then, we are in the middle of the function, we are locked. You have to check that tween is not active in here. If I remove that part of the condition, I can start my move to function multiple times and I'm going to override the tween right in the middle. In this case, it might look like the game is working normally, but one thing you're going to do is because you're going to spawn multiple instances of that function, you're going to emit the move to signal as soon as the tween completed signal is emitted multiple times with the position. So the callback method is going to receive the information multiple times as well. So if you're not careful with coroutines, you can create nasty bugs in your programs. So now I can keep clicking. You can see on Keymon that I keep clicking and as the character is moving, it's not going to do anything. We have to wait for the character to arrive to destination to have him move to another target. This is the same technique, the same principle that Razvan has been using and we've been using on OpenRPG when the characters move. So when you click somewhere, you might change the destination, but the characters are going to move to the first target, to the first order they received. and the interesting part about this approach, this code, is that you can use it for an RTS game to queue orders on a character. In this OpenRPG fork, this happens in the walk behavior. The structure of this code is going to be a little more complex than what we have seen before, because as I was telling you, you have some code to initialize the state of the character when you want it to start running, and then you have some cleanup as well, just in case you were to stop or invalidate the walk action right in the middle. And in this case, we want the character to move on every cell in a path that's provided by the pathfinder in the game. And so we are going for each point the character has to move to. We're going to have a tween. We're going to move the character to that point, start the tween, wait until the animation completed, and then we can move to the next point in the list. So that's exactly what I was talking about. We are queuing actions on the character, move to the cell to the right, then to the cell to the bottom, then to the right again, etc. We have something similar with the menu, the circular menu in OpenRPG, where you have to wait for it to finish opening or closing before you can start to move um, to the right or the left skill. And so this is handled by a tween once again. If you will look at the open function, this is the method that controls the open animation. We are spawning the tweens for the buttons for each of the buttons that we have in the menu. We call tween.start and then we wait for the tween to complete. So once again, same technique. I think one of the most common cases where you use coroutines in Godot over signals is working with animation in general, the animation player and the tweens because you can have the flow of the code all linear. If you use a signal, you have to call back another function. So you have to split this open function in two and have something like on tween completed, which uh, is a little harder to keep track of, especially if you have an animation like that, that you need to implement via code, but you need multiple yields inside of it. So you have multiple sequences in your animation. 
This is what we have with the intro of the combat in the game. We have two yield statements because we first want the party to appear and then we want the monsters to appear and all of that, both animations that play with a small offset are part of the intro animation sequence but at the same time this appear animation is a bit flexible we want to handle it via code because you might want to play a cutscene before you play the intro animation there's never the same number of monsters or characters in the combat arena and you might want a monster to to have some special animation where they move a bit further than the other characters so we just use a timer and this is the length that we have allowed ourselves for the animation for now. Not the most flexible system, but that's the base that we have for the prototype. And so thanks to coroutines, we can have a linear function, just one block that represents our entire animation sequence. Now, there is a special signal that you can use with coroutines. It's completed and completed corresponds to the function being destroyed, the function object, or the function returning, being finished, if you want. We use that again in this combat arena, the combat system in OpenRPG, and we have this battle start method that the upper game node can call to start the battle, and it's going to wait for the play intro method to complete. So the play intro is going to stop on this yield keyword for 0.5 seconds, and it's going to stop here as well for 0.5 seconds. And after that, it simply sits, but this function returns, so it finishes. And if you want, when you have coroutines, functions are objects with a state that gets stored, that's what's happening in memory. So when you finally return from the function, this object gets deleted, and that is where you get your completed signal. So you wait for the play intro function to reach the end here and at that point it will be completed so we can set the battle arena to active and start the player's first turn. Note that we were using it quite a bit in OpenRPG and it's an important tool to keep in mind. You can wait for a function to finish a calculation for example using that yield keyword and waiting for the completed signal. But with that, that's not too bad for an intro to coroutines. You can find the project, a link to it in the video description below. I want to thank you kindly for watching. And that's it. Be creative, have fun, and let's see one another in the next one. Bye-bye.